Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on G-protein coupled receptors. In this video, what we're going to do is discuss the Ballesteros Weinstein numbering system, which is basically a numbering system for numbering the residues on the alpha helices of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so the Ballesteros uh, Weinstein uh, numbering system. Okay, so uh, we'll start off with just a little chat about uh, the structure, structures of G-protein coupled receptors. Then we'll give the motivation for the Ballesteros Weinstein numbering system, and then I'll actually tell you what it is. Okay, right. So let's start off with the basic structure of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so G protein coupled receptors and G protein coupled receptors are often abbreviated to GPCRs. Now they are the biggest family of proteins in all of biology. There's over 800 G protein coupled receptors uh, just in the human basically. So that is a massive number. They are easily the biggest family of proteins known. Okay, and most, well, a good fraction of the drugs that are currently used clinically work on G protein coupled receptors. So it's an incredibly important family of proteins. And they're often abbreviated just to GP. PCRs. Okay, right, now, uh, what do they look like? Well, basically, they sit in the cell membrane, okay, and their amino terminus is on the extracellular side of the membrane, okay, so this side of the membrane will represent the extracellular fluid side, the ECF side, and this side of the membrane will represent the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. Okay, so the amino terminus is on the extracellular fluid side. Then you have the first membrane spanning alpha helix, the second membrane spanning alpha helix, the third membrane spanning alpha helix, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. And then the carboxylic acid terminus is on the intracellular aspect. Okay, so this is a common structure for all 800 of the G-protein coupled receptors. They all have these seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. Okay, uh, so let me just highlight them up. So, uh, let's discuss the structure of a membrane-spanning alpha helix. Okay, uh, so what is an alpha helix? Well, basically, it's a secondary protein structure, which means that it's a three-dimensional structure which polypeptides can adopt. And what holds a polypeptide in that structure is bonds between uh, the core amino acid structures, basically, of the polypeptide chain. So let me explain what I mean by that. So basically, when you build a protein, you have around 20 amino acids to work with, and what you produce is a polymer of amino acids, okay? And this is called a polypeptide. So it's amino acid after amino acid after amino acid. So you have an amino terminus over here and a carboxylic acid terminus over here, okay? And in between you have loads and loads and loads of amino acids, basically. Okay, right. And they're all linked by peptide bonds where you link the carboxylic acid terminus of one amino acid to the amino terminus of the next amino acid along uh, by an amide link, basically. Okay, so the primary structure of a polypeptide uh, is the actual sequence of amino acids. So there are 20 different amino acids that you can put in every single position. And the exact sequence you have in your final polypeptide is the primary structure of the protein. Okay, now, of course, that doesn't tell you what the actual shape of the protein is. So, we can now fold the protein up, the polypeptide up, into a three-dimensional shape, basically. And that shape will be held together by uh, bonds between uh, residue, well, between functional groups on the polypeptide molecule. Now, the secondary structure refers to the way that the polypeptide folds in three-dimensional space, where the interactions that are considered secondary interactions are interactions between amino groups and carboxylic acid groups of polypeptide, or, well, of the amino acids that are polymerized together to make the polypeptide. 
So to do this, uh, to make this clearer, let's just uh, have a draw a little bit of the polypeptide out in a bit more detail. So we'll start with the amino terminus over here. Okay, then we've got our first amino acid, so uh, it will have an alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off, and then it will have some R group. Okay, and we don't really care what that R group is at the moment. Okay, then we'll have a carboxylic acid group, then we'll have this first amino acid here is now complete, and it will now be bound to the next amino acid along. Here's the amino group, and then you've got the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it, then some other R group. And these are the things which will vary depending on what your primary structure is. Then you'll have the carboxylic acid group here, etc. And it goes on and on. So we'll have the next one here. Let's just draw three out. We'll have the amino group. Then it's alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off. The R double prime group now. Because I'm, I don't want to suggest that R, R prime and R double prime are the same. So that's why I'm uh, using the priming system. Okay, and then we've got the carboxylic acid group here, and it will continue on. So, when you are going to fold this polypeptide up into a 3D structure, the interactions that hold the 3D structure together can either be between R groups, or they can be between these core structures. So basically, no matter what your primary structure is, i.e. no matter what your R groups are, you always have these peptide link structures here, and you'll have more of them, okay? And basically, secondary protein structures are structures which will be held together by interactions between uh, these peptide link uh, groups here, so the carbonyl group here and the amino group here, okay, or the amide link, as we could call this. So we'll call this the peptide group, if you like, or you could call it the amide group. So basically, secondary structures are held together by bonds between peptide groups of the polypeptide, rather than bonds between the R groups. The tertiary structure of the protein uh, involves uh, interactions between the R groups that stabilize the tertiary folding. Okay, so alpha helices are a uh, secondary structure, so they're held together by interactions between these peptide groups, basically. So, let's just draw one. Well, I'll start off with a cheap picture, and then I'll draw a more expensive picture that will take me longer to do. So, basically, a cheap picture of an alpha helix is that the polypeptide folds around and around like this. Basically, an alpha helix is just a spring. If you've seen a spring, then you know what an alpha helix is. Okay, so the question then is, how does the uh, polypeptide hold itself in this structure? What uh, interactions are holding the polypeptide in this spring-like shape, in this alpha helix? So an alpha helix is just a fancy name for a spring shape. Okay, so basically it's interactions between the peptide links. So let's now draw a more expensive picture. So basically what you're going to have is the amino terminus here and this line now represents amino acid after amino acid after amino acid and now I'm going to draw uh, one amino acid out where I actually draw its structure so I'm not going to show every amino acid some amino acids will be demoted to just being represented by line okay uh, but I will draw some of them okay so here's my, the first one I'm planning on drawing so here's the alpha carbon with the R group Here's a carboxylic acid group, okay, and then uh, it will take it onwards like this, and then the whole thing will loop back around, okay, and it will go down like so. So I'm trying to show this structure here, okay, and it will go round like this, and then we'll come back round. So basically, I haven't drawn a line through there because I don't want to mess up my picture, but what we're drawing is this again here. So this is this portion here is this portion here. So I've gone back to showing amino acids polymerized together just as a line, basically. And then it will come down here, and then what you'll have is the next amino acid along. Okay, so that, well, the next amino acid that I'm going to show, basically, not the next amino acid along, the next amino acid along would have been sitting here, okay, but the next amino acid I'm going to actually show the structure of will be here. Okay, and that should be R prime, 
hydrogen like so, and then the carboxylic acid group going down there. And then this will go back round and continue on. So basically, what is holding this alpha helix together? Well, it's bonds between carbonyl groups of the peptide links of the um, strand above this strand in the alpha helix. So let me just highlight them in. So this portion here in blue is this portion that we've got here. Okay. This portion in red here is this portion here. And basically the reason that red and blue are going to remain bound together is that this carbonyl group in blue is going to interact with this amino group in red and it's going to interact via a hydrogen bond. So basically um, this bond here, this carbonyl group, is extremely polar. And the reason is that oxygen has a greater electronegativity than carbon. So electronegativity is a fantastically big word. Okay, but what does it actually mean? Well, basically, in this double bond that we have between the carbon and the oxygen, there are four electrons. The oxygen provides two electrons and the carbon provides two electrons. Now, Basically, they are sharing the electrons, but the electrons are feeling attraction to both of them, okay? Because both of them have a nucleus, okay? They both have a nucleus which is full of neutrons and protons. Neutrons are positive, sorry, neutrons are neutrally charged and protons are positively charged. So overall, the nucleus is a positively charged uh, mass of uh, protons and neutrons. So the electrons are all feeling attraction to the nuclei, okay? And they're feeling an attraction to the carbon nucleus and a carbon to the uh, an attraction to the oxygen nucleus. Okay? Now, the question is which attraction is stronger? Okay? Well, it's the attraction to the oxygen nucleus. That is what is meant by oxygen has a greater electronegativity than carbon. It means that the attraction that electrons will feel to the oxygen nucleus is greater than the attraction that the electrons will feel to the carbon nucleus. That is what is meant by oxygen having a greater electronegativity than carbon. Its ability to pull electrons towards it is greater than carbon's. So the electrons in this, these double bonds uh, will feel a greater attraction towards the oxygen nucleus and therefore will spend more time close to the oxygen nucleus than the carbon nucleus and this results in the oxygen having a slight negative charge and the carbon having a slight positive charge. Similarly, nitrogen has a much greater electronegativity than hydrogen, so the electrons in this bond will spend more time near the nitrogen than the uh, hydrogen, so the hydrogen will get a positive charge and the nitrogen will get a partial negative charge. Now. Uh, the hydrogen, which has a positive charge, can bind to the oxygen, which has a negative charge, particularly because the oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons, but I'll only show one of these, okay? And a lone pair of electrons is a center of negative charge. So not only is the whole oxygen atom slightly negatively charged, but it's also got this beautiful center of negative charge here in the form of the lone pair. So basically, the partial positive charge on the hydrogen atom will bind to the center of negative charge on the oxygen atom by a bond that's called a hydrogen bond, but basically it's just an electrostatic interaction. Okay, so this is called a hydrogen bond. And basically, hydrogen bonding is one of the strongest forms of sorry, intermolecular bonding. Okay, so you've got hydrogen bonds that are holding um, the um, polypeptide above to the polypeptide below, and you'll have hydrogen bonds all over the place. You won't just have one between this blue portion and this red portion. You'll have them all over the place, basically, and they are holding uh, these um, poly well, these layered uh, polypeptide pieces on top of one another, basically. Okay, and that holds the whole thing in an alpha helical structure. Okay, so that's the structure of an alpha helix. Okay, we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video, we'll see the Ballesteros-Weinstein numbering system.